I've lived in the Detroit area since 1950. And at that time, in, that, uh, in the city of Detroit, there were communities where it was just understood. You don't go, you don't even traffic in those areas. But I, I liked that house. I remember that home. I liked that house. I liked it. I, there were other places. But I wanted to get into something nice and away from the normal geographical areas of where uh, African Americans lived. Where we live determines how we live. And for much of the last century, the ability to live anywhere in Metro Detroit was a privilege reserved for a few. In October of 2009, the Michigan Roundtable began the housing project Truth and Justice. The housing project has three phases, each designed to address racial inequities created and perpetuated by the past policies of the Federal Housing Administration in the Metro Detroit community. The first phase of the housing project demonstrated how public policies and governmental institutions encouraged segregation in Southeast Michigan. Hosted at the Wayne State University Law School, the centerpiece of the event was a mock trial, which focused on the discriminatory practices of the FHA throughout the 20th century. Oye, 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 all rise for the Honorable Judge Victoria Roberts. A mock trial is basically a simulated trial. Uh, often a, real attorneys will use them to practice for uh, an actual trial that they're preparing for. Uh, in this instance, we uh, just simulated a trial on housing discrimination for uh, educational purposes. Accumulate well and appreciate with the appreciation. You're actually developing examination of the witnesses. Um, jury instructions, in our case, opening and closing statements. So it gives people a better feel and sense of what uh, really went into the issue as opposed to just talking about it in the abstract terms. The plaintiff in this case is Marvin Miller, and he brings this case of race discrimination against the Federal Housing Administration. The FHA was on trial for a series of counts related to housing discrimination. And essentially what we were trying them for, what they were being tried for, um, were purposeful actions designed to affect a pattern and practice of discrimination in Detroit. I was on the plaintiff's side and our argument was that FHA basically implemented discriminatory policies that encouraged discriminatory lending. And what we basically said is we started off with the 1938 underwriting manual and we focused on the use of restrictive covenants in keeping African Americans out of certain neighborhoods that were already FHA approved. By doing some hands-on research on the project, it made it even more tangible and real to actually see a deed to a home that says something along the lines of, uh, this house shall not be sold to any one of the Ethiopian race, or you know, something really strange and appalling like that. Um, you know, to read about it in a, in a textbook is one thing, but it really strikes you when you see the actual document. The lawyer's evidence and arguments may have been the focus of the mock trial, but Michigan Roundtable added a number of features to the event to encourage a more engaging and interactive experience for the audience. The second half of the conference consisted of workshops with presenters from across the state leading discussions about the social effects of institutional racism on Metro Detroit communities. When FHA, the Federal Housing Administration, uh, began uh, uh, a, a, an insurance program for housing in the 1930s, and part of that program uh, took into account uh, that white folks didn't want to have black people as neighbors. Even if you had the income, even if you had the money, the down payment, what have you, to buy in that neighborhood, and it was already FHA approved, the covenant in the deed would restrict the seller from even selling the home to you. This was the United States of America speaking as to how we wanted the, the housing to operate in the 1930s and 40s. And, and what we were saying as uh, citizens, and it was the white majority that was saying it, is we want to make, create a system where black people are excluded from uh, white neighborhoods. Mr. Cochran, would you raise your right hand, please? Do you solemnly swear or affirm that you will tell the entire truth in your testimony here today? I do. 
Thank you. Take your seat. Good morning, Mr. Cochran. Good morning, sir. Did you ever own a house in the city of Detroit? Yes, I did. When did you first uh, purchase a house in Detroit? Uh, in 1952. And where did you purchase that house? I purchased uh, that home in northwest Detroit on Steel Street. Uh, and what was the racial makeup of the area in which you purchased this house? At that time, there were no whites, no blacks in that area. I was the first black to uh, become a, a resident in that area. We would have been better off had we uh, uh, not been uh, treated uh, as second-class citizens. The history of FHA was deeply involved in patterns of uh, discrimination, and it's uh, uh, something that, we, uh, a part of history that uh, uh, not too many people have paid attention to. It wasn't just the FHA doing something. It was everybody from the private landlord who was, you know, writing something into his rental contract or writing something into a land contract, to neighborhood associations, um, to city administration, to state and federal actors. If you look at um, the history, and especially in Detroit, where you had the automotive industry, where you had blacks and whites working alongside on the line, earning a certain wage, yet they couldn't live next to each other or they didn't have the same opportunities to buy housing, even though they had basically the same wages, you want to know why that is. It almost amazes me in a lot of ways that there were successful people. There were people who got into neighborhoods and were able to integrate and were able to make those strides because the array of forces you had against you just, it seems so intimidating. I think it's important to know for uh, history's sake. And as I reflect back, I did make some, probably made some accomplishments that I wasn't really aware of. And uh, they may have an appreciation for some of us who paved the way, whether we knew what we were doing or not, to uh, be successful in uh, having those advantages now. Detroit is the way it is today because of the past several decades. And if you don't understand that past, you're never going to deal with the present and you're never going to have a better future. Ladies and gentlemen, I understand that you have reached a verdict. To the question, did plaintiff prove each and every element of at least one of his claims for racial discrimination? We, the jury, select yes. What is the amount of damage you award to the plaintiff? Compensatory, compensatory damages in the amount of $250,000. I wish to thank all of you for honoring us with your presence today. And if nothing else, go out and tell your neighbor, tell a family member, tell a coworker what happened here today. Because it's important that we acknowledge the history. Building upon the success of the mock trial held last fall at Wayne State University and the housing exhibit which preceded the trial, the Michigan Roundtable will build upon that work by the creation of the Housing Project Partnership. The partnership will serve as the foundational base for moving ahead with the planning and selection of a Truth Commission. The Truth Commission will be regionally based and will consist of a number of members from the community, from education, from the media, from faith, from other like organizations, from business and government. And this group will convene to select over the next year a plan for the commission as well as the commissioners themselves. And this whole process fits in with the Roundtable's Transitions Framework. The trial was the ending. We acknowledge history, it was the legal accountability. Now, the Regional Truth Commission moves into a space of dialogue and discussion of how we can move forward and get to a new beginning, which will be the development of a plan for regional equity.